Hello everyone, welcome to the DDK podcast. It's been a long, long time, but I'm really happy to have Minnie on the show here today with me. Minnie is an aiming expert, somebody that's broken a bunch of world records when it comes to all the aim trainers, and he's someone that knows a lot about mouse control, the training, he's a coach, and the perfect person to talk to when it comes to understanding really the best knowledge that we now have when it comes to aiming, because there's still a lot of misconceptions and myths a lot lots of ways that people are training that maybe aren't effective and so i'm hoping to kind of cover all of those topics here today with mini so you guys can get a better understanding of what good aiming practices look like and we can kind of tackle some of those those common questions so uh, thanks for joining me mini it's great to see you hey welcome thank you thank you for inviting me as well it was like a very good way of starting out talking more about aim trainers like talking with you to kind of like link the misconceptions would be like a good way of like getting more people involved into aim training because they have like a lot of ideas kind of like thinking about aim trainers in like a wrong way so we kind of like want to clear them as quickly as possible so they can actually enjoy the process of like improvement yeah you know you're, you're, you're someone that's really been just in the weeds with aim training for a long time i think something that many people don't really understand because it's very niche is the aiming yes. community as a whole and just this whole world of aim trainers and, and it's very foreign i think to a lot of people in esports so before we kind of get into the the nuts and bolts of some of this i'd love to, for you to give people a, a better sense of of your background how you got into into aim training some of your achievements you know what what your mission is and just your general journey with with aim training so i'm like a csgo player I have over 10k hours in CSGO, so I always were playing like tag FPS games. I always enjoyed playing CS, kind of like face-it matches, matchmaking matches. And I always felt that my aim is kind of like behind. So I, I was always training using like headshot deathmatch, aimbots, like a lot of like maps, a lot of ways. Sure. I was watching a lot of videos, for example, the Advent ones with the cross replacement. I don't know if you are familiar with them. He used to like record videos with like tips for CS. And I was like really following them a lot for my aim. And that's what I was doing. And one day, when I was like playing CS, I saw my friend was playing a game called Kovacs FPS Aim Trainer. And I was like, FPS Aim Trainer? I was like, what is this? I looked up into it and I was like, okay, so it's like a software that can kind of like help you with aim. I was like very skeptical about it because I thought playing the game initially, just, just playing the game would be better. Same. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna give it a try. And then I saw the leaderboards, the out of scenarios. I was kind of like confused initially, but then I was like, okay, give it, let me give it a try. And I realized there's like a lot of cool scenarios to actually practice and I saw that there's like no downtime Like in, for example in CS when we play deathmatch You have like a downtime between kills, sometimes you just run around the map kind of like looking for the targets to shoot at In internet it's like you always have the targets So I was like okay, it makes sense And then I was like kind of like getting more involved into it And then I learned about M community It's kind of like a niche as you said Kind of like a group of people that's like more passionate about aiming rather than Kind of like learning the game from like a Pro perspective because if we think about the games it's kind of like more about learning how to have the map knowledge kind of like how to position ourselves not just aim and there's like a group of people that is kind of like only thinking about their aim and kind of like is super passionate about it so i was like getting into that group as well and i learned a lot about aiming kind of like mostly through in trainers this way awesome yeah and that kind of then propelled you to that that journey of the obsession and working on your yes. own skills and talents. So what, what, how did that, how did that go exactly? Because even, even now I feel like for many people, when you approach aim trainers, you know, I think many people understand that, you know, the basic concept that, okay, this is there to train my aim. That's what it says on the tin. But I think for many people, they're not necessarily using it correctly, or it's kind of hard to know how to, how to improve with it. It's kind of like going into the gym with absolutely mm -hmm. zero knowledge. And you know that if you try to pick up some weights, you know, something might happen, but you could train for a long time in the gym and really get very bad results overall based on the time you're investing. So that that's not something you're gonna stick with. So how did you kind of figure that out yourself? And, and, and when did you start seeing improvements? Did you kind of have some epiphanies in how you were training? So firstly, like as a beginner, I also had this kind of like idea that it's like a bit too confusing for me. There's like a lot of scenarios, a lot of kind of like training modes that you can use. There's like a thousands of them, like different scenarios created by the community. And I was like, kind of like confused what's going on, like what to play to improve for a specific game that I used to play. So it was CSGO. It still is CSGO, but now it's like more CS2, of course. But yeah, I was like looking for ways to improve at my CSGO aim. And I was like super confused by the amount of tasks. 
So initially, what I thought is maybe looking up some sort of like guides on the internet about aim trainers. And I found out Aimer 7 guide about Kovacs. And in this guide, he kind of like gave me the direction, like the sense of direction, kind of like explaining a lot of concepts I was thinking about, about in training and kind of like living some sort of like tr like a training routine to stick to. And I was like really into like sticking to this like training routines kind of like proposed by the community because they were also explained why they might help me out. So for example, there was like a click timing routine and it was like explained that it can help me with my click timing inside of the game as well. And I was like, okay, it makes sense. I do use a lot of click timing inside of CS. I'm going to do it. And I feel like if I were to come back, I would like instantly look for some sort of like a guide that can kind of like help me out with clearing out a lot of like misconceptions I might have in my head and like kind of like look for some good scenarios this way. Like using a routine is like super important in my opinion. Like finding out that routine early on is always gonna like help us a bit faster than if you were to touch like if you were to kind of like find it out about in like later stage of entraining. So that's what it was like. I kind of like look into some guides and through the guide, I kind of like learned a lot about aiming initially. So it helped me a lot with getting started. And how long ago was this? It was like two years ago. Two years ago. Okay, cool. Yes. Right. And you know, in that two years time, um, I know that you've, you've, you know, you've got a lot of achievements in terms of sort of the skill that you've, that you've reached with, you know, world records and so on. Can you like tell people about sort of your strengths and some of the, the world records that you've managed to, to, to get with aim trainers? Yes, of course. So my main category of choice is flicking. I do play like FPS games, as I said before. So I thought improving at my flicks will be super important. So I kind of like took some time to practice my flicks and develop my flicks to the next level. So this being said, I reached world records in a lot of flicking scenarios. Like in aim labs, you might know some sort of them. One, like one of from the like most popular tasks that you might know will be six shot from aim labs. It's kind of like a very popular static clicking task. And I used to hold world record on this task for a year. Now I'm like top two because I could beat them. Of course, the competition is always growing. So we need to expect that our scores will be beaten. So I was holding like a world record for like entire year on this task. And I was the very first guy to reach 200K score on this task. So I was kind of like breaking the ice for the other players. I kind of like showed them that it's kind of like achievable to get this sort of level on this specific task that they can actually reach this level and push themselves because before I reached this like 200k barrier people thought it's impossible so that was kind of like a big achievement for me and I was super proud about it and I was holding this world record for almost like a year and it was recently beaten by Array Bulldog another very proficient static player that has very insane flicks so with this I also have like very good target switching scores because target switching initially means that you switch between targets. So it also relates to our flicking skills. So my main kind of like category that I'm really good at is flicking. And I do have a lot of world records on like static clicking mostly. That's my main kind of uh, category that I used to play and I still play to this day. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of my audience is probably predominantly these days it's going to be CS and Valorant focused, so definitely mm -hmm. more more flicking focused uh, in in terms of the the skill set like skill sets like you described. Um, but you know, of course, you then kind of moved into coaching. So and you've coached a lot of uh, like very notable uh, CS uh, pros as well as Valorant pros. So kind of can you yeah t t uh, talk us through that sort of journey and, and some of the individuals you've coached and how that how that's been. So maybe at first I would want to say how I did even got into aim coaching in the first place. So I was streaming myself playing static scenarios on Twitch, like streaming in trainers. And some people were like asking me for some tips. I was always kind of like trying to give them some sense of direction. And one day a guy was like, yo, can you coach me for like a month so I can kind of like develop my skills under you? And I was like, okay, let's try it out. Maybe I will be able to help. Especially because he wanted to improve at static clicking, which is my main category. I was like, okay, I should be able to help him. And I worked with him for like a month for free. Like kind of like trying to see if I can even help. And he was like super happy about it. And I was like, okay, I might start doing coaching because he told me I'm pretty good at this. So I took this risk of announcing that I will be starting my coaching. And I started coaching this way, like setting up the price for like a very low, kind of like around like 10 to like $20 for like entire month of work. And I was trying to get my skills up. And this way I was like working with a lot of players across different FPS titles, like Call of Duty, CSGO, Valorant, and later on, I was gaining more experience as a player as well. I was reach reaching way higher results. And I was also getting way, 
like way more valuable clients. I would call them more valuable because they are like professional players. It's kind of like a different piece of cake when you work with like a pro that has like a lot of insane fundamentals down and a player that is kind of like learning the journey from zero. It's like a different type of cake. So like along the process, I was getting more familiar with a lot of concepts as well. And I get to work with like many different clients. Yeah, I think so uh, it was. Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I suppose maybe the most famous would be Elige. Is that, is that correct? Yes, yeah. I used to work with Elige. He's like a CSGO player. From Valorant, I used to work with Avova. He was in G2 at that time. Now, he's, now he is in the Team Heretics. I think he might be leaving the team recently, sadly, but he is like a Valorant Tier 1 Pro. And right now, I'm also working with Chronicle. He's like a Fnatic player that played recently in the major for Valorant called VCT. I think it's called VCT. I'm sorry. I'm like a CS player. So, <laughs> so that's, that's some, sometimes I'm kind of like missing up the terms. So yes, I do work with a lot of professional players from Valorant and CS mainly because I'm also like a CS player myself. So I find myself being better at coaching this type of games, kind of like helping with this type of games in comparison to like Quake or some other titles like Overwatch, because I haven't really played them that much to be able to give like valuable tips. Got it. So, I mean, one of the interesting things about this is, you know, a lot of people will say, you know, okay, aim training is going to be super useful for players, you know, that maybe aren't at the pro level, pretty much all levels, not at the pro level, because most of the pros have already exceptional aim. And, and I think, yeah, you can definitely make the, the argument that the edges they'll gain from improved mechanics are probably less than the edges they'll gain from better teamwork or better strategy or better decision-making uh, at the a absolute pro level. But that's, I mean, it's interesting, you know, you've, you've been working with pro players, you know, how has the, the feedback been from them in terms of how, how, you know, aim training has helped them? Cause, cause I, you know, mm -hmm. obviously working with hundred D's and so on, and, and speaking to lots of pros, most pros don't think at all about aim training in this way, or trying to, trying to work on their technique. They'll just put more hours in, um, ultimately into playing the game. So I'm really curious what your, cause, cause you're kind of almost breaking new ground with this, to, to be honest. Um, like what is your feedback being from them in terms of how it's helped them and how do you even assess players that are already that good? And then, then you're basically thinking, okay, I'm going to program around where I feel like you're weak. Um, you know, how do you, how does that process even work and what's the feedback being? So firstly, we need to like, think, why do they even want to get coached in the first place? As a pro player, you have a lot of options like in your own team you have your own coaches a lot of different coaches that can help you with a lot of stuff like health stuff nutrition like the game sense the tactics everything and when it comes to like aiming there's like not really a coach here in this space right so they need to like work on the things by their own so kind of like when it comes to aiming usually pro players are kind of like working on it by their own routines their own ways that they know of and with aim trainers, when they notice that there's a lot of players that are able to reach the higher level with their aim alone, they might be like, okay, maybe these players are able to push us even more because they might know more stuff about aiming just because they are able to get like better results than us, kind of like more consistency. So a lot of pro players are deciding to get coached because they know that they might learn something new for this way. And as a pro player, you need to really use like any means possible to win and be like on the top of the competition. So even like a slight increase in aiming over your opponents will help you a lot. So that's how usually they think about it. And usually like coaching works like you need to take a look at their thoughts from the game of choice they have, like CS or Valorant. I mostly coach Valorant nowadays, it seems like because CS players have a lot of tools inside of the game, so they don't really look much into aim trainers. Like outside of Elich, maybe, I don't know, like two other pro players that are actually trying to use aim trainers. The rest of them are kind of like playing the in-game. So I mainly work with Valorant players. So the process usually looks like I watch some Valorant thoughts of them playing deathmatch, of them playing ranked matches, scrim matches. And I take a look only at their like duels and what is happening in the duels from like the raw aim perspective, trying to kind of like look for some weaknesses they have some sort of strengths they might have, and then kind of like trying to isolate those with aim trainers to have like a better practice. Because as I said previously, you have like no downtime in aim trainers. So you're able to kind of like put something into the practice and kind of like practice this same skill for like eternity. So it's kind of like making it easier to progress. Because if you will take like a very common mistake that people have inside of the game, so for example, shooting at AD strafing targets, 
like inside of Valorant, you can do maybe like two or three options to kind of like train and work around this issue. The option number one would be to play deathmatch. And on deathmatch, people are not always doing AD, AD. They can also do like long strafes, they can also stop. They can use operators, they can use a lot of different guns. So you might not be able to isolate AD strafing targets as well as you will be with like different tools. And then you think, okay, different tools, range, because in range mode, you have the strafe option. I think you have the strafe option in Valorant. So the strafe option in Valorant, it's kind of like predictable on the range. It's kind of like bodies moving, stopping, moving, stopping. It's kind of like you can memorize the pattern and that's it. You don't really improve that much about actually trying to hit the moving target. And in end trainers, you can make like a task in which you can isolate this certain aspect to your hard content pretty much. So it's kind of like making it easier to progress. And a lot of players really value this isolation part. And that's what makes them kind of like feeling better about aim training and outcome of their practice usually is super good. They get to know more about the te techniques. They get to know more about the demands of aim and what they are doing wrong. Because a lot of them don't really like analyze their aim that much. They kind of like play the game. There's like a lot of factors to focus on outside of the aim because they need to be knowing the techniques of working in like a team setting. So it's kind of like a different piece, piece of cake. And they usually feel very happy after learning more about their own mechanics because every player wants to have like good mechanics. So, so far their experience is super good from what I've heard from them. Awesome. Yeah. And, and I know, I know, you know, we mentioned some of the people that you have been coaching. I know there's a lot of other pros too that have been exploring this and getting good results. Um, you know, Ye is one of those players. And I've, I'm pretty sure that he said, um, publicly at some point that he really gave or at least he gave a lot of credit to increased like mechanical skill and consistency especially during that run that he had with optic where where you know that you know that was then sort of the year where people were saying oh this this guy's the best player in the world and his aim was you know a huge feature of that he you know he was in, in, incredibly mm -hmm. consistent um and uh you know i think jing as well is is another one as well he's also a mechanical monster but i think i think most relevant now and someone i definitely want to ask you about is demon one um, because Demon One, uh, I don't think a lot of people know necessarily because he kind of came out of nowhere. But he, he, from what I understand, is someone that really understands how to use aim trainers and kind of came from the aim training community to an extent. And now, obviously, he's he's looking like mechanically maybe the best player in VCT. So, um, yeah, t t what are your thoughts on Demon One? So Demon One is definitely an amazing player. There is like no doubt about it. He even proved himself now by winning the tournament. So. I have nothing to say against that. And yes, he's also known for like aim training. Like I remember I was watching his thoughts. He used to aim train a lot using some sort of like aim lab tasks. Like even when there was like an AG scouting, they were like scouting for players in the team. They also used aim labs and Demon One has like the best scores out like all of the players they were scouting. So it kind of like showed the consistency that he was like working through with aim trainers was also kind of like helping him out, like choosing the opportunity to join the team. So like aim trainers like kind of like played like a huge factor like in his case i believe of kind of like enabling himself to get these opportunities and now we can like see how good he is with like his mechanics just because he was super consistent and deliberate with his practice like i saw he also had some sort of routines inside of aim trainers he was exploring a lot of different tasks he also uses a lot of like in-game tools to practice we can't really forget about aim training tools inside of the game those are super important like when it comes to like aim training, like we need to think of it as like a supplement, not like a substitute for like in-game practice. So I saw that he was also playing a lot of like death matches, a lot of range inside of Valorant. He was also supporting himself with the trainings. And yeah, those showed a lot of good results in the scouting, then in games. And he's definitely like one of the best players. That is kind of like a proof that with consistent practice, you're able to reach like a very high mechanical level. Yeah, and it's it's really it's really interesting to see too because at least when I watch him, I'd see I feel like obviously he has amazing mouse control, and it just feels like he's able to adapt his aim so extremely well to almost any situation in a way that you don't really see from a lot of other pros. Like a lot of other pros, that, I don't know. It's hard for me to put into words. Maybe you'd be better able to describe it because you know ass assessing. Uh, how people aim is part of part of your job essentially um but but to me there is something different about how demon one aims when you compare him to almost every other pro and so that's an, you know another reason why i wanted to kind of bring him bring him up uh before we move on from demon one is there is there anything else um that you know when you've watched him that you've noticed that you think is particularly impressive yes so what's like super impressive to me is that he is able to kind of like apply the common like aiming 
techniques that we use in aim trainers. Like in aim trainers, we usually try to be accurate. We usually try to be more deliberate with our shots. So kind of like taking some time before aiming so we can actually apply like a proper flick technique, not really rushing the process. And in his gameplay, he's not really rushing this process. He's always trying to make it like perfect. And this kind of like leads to higher accuracy. So that's super amazing. He's able to kind of like apply some in-game aim with his like aim lap aim, if that makes sense. Kind of like mixing up the two concepts. It's like a lot of players struggling with this, kind of like trying to transition from aim training into their own game, trying to enable themselves to use the exact same skill set. And in his case, it's kind of like different. He's able to incorporate his like well-trained habits into actual game. And that's what makes him like a very good player as well. Perfect. That's, that actually really sums it up really nicely, um, I think, basically. Because that's what it feels like when I was watching him. Like, it kind of feels like he is playing a task when he's he's actually playing a scenario um, when he's when he's actually playing in game because because like you say the way that he takes his time uh, in very precious situations it, it's very interesting um, and yes. so I, I I think this is all like a really good setup because we are seeing players who are making the best use of correct aim training uh, through through these aim training tools and the right approaches and methods we're seeing them having really really great results. So with that said, I'd love to now sort of jump into this next sort of segment essentially for this interview, which is I want to get your thoughts on essentially a, a bunch of aiming myths and misconceptions. I'm going to throw uh, some at you and, uh, Anna, and, I, and, and this is the thing too, with the aiming community, um, as a, as a quick uh, backdrop on, on my involvement with it, I worked for AimLab for a couple of years, uh, a couple of years ago was when I left. And I had no idea about the aiming community before that point, but when, once I sort of understood what was going on, I'm like, oh my God, these guys, th th they're just basically pushing the envelope and sort of the knowledge of aiming and, and how to get better at aiming. And that they're doing that and that's their only focus. And, and this doesn't exist anywhere else. So there has to be some knowledge there that they have that nobody else has. And I think that that's still the case. And if some of these myths and misconceptions are things that I thought that when I entered the aiming community world, I'm like, oh, I was just, you know, I was just wrong. So... Uh, let's get let's get into it. The the, the first one, um, which was the first one that blew my mind when watching the best aimers from aim, the aim training community, uh, was is a myth of you know consistent sensitivity. Is that important? So like a lot of people think that you know they need to have like one sense and stick to it for like ten years to have like the best possible aim that you can get. Like it was like very popular in CS, I believe, when I was playing as well. When I was like watching like pro players, they were always like stick to one sense learn the muscle memory stuff and like become the best kind of like get the feeling of your sense and i kind of like get why and why it's like even coming from their mouths it's like they really want to be consistent as a players and like having some sort of like consistency with their settings is as important as being consistent with their like in-game aim right so it's kind of like mixing up both uh, things so like i understand why people want to stick to one sense and have it consistent because Consistency plays like a big factor inside of the game and we really want to build that comfort with our sense to kind of like perform at like the highest level possible. However, at times like people have like this like big misconception that sticking to one sense can make them like the best aimers. It's not really true. Like if you would want to be like a good aimers, like aimer, you would be able to play every single FPS title with like a good aim. So, like, if you would want to be good at every single game with your aim, you will need to have, like, a good mouse control. Mouse control means that you have an ability to kind of, like, control your mouse in, like, various ways, like, having comfort with different angles, like, white flicks, using your entire mouse pad, doing the micro corrections. And, like, good mouse control allows us to kind of, like, aim at different speeds. So, like, all speeds, like, slow, fast, like, it will change from the game to game. Like, in Overwatch, we need to be a bit faster. In CS, we need to be a bit slower. Like, we need to be able to aim at different ranges. We need to be able to have very good flick to track skills. And there is, like, a lot of things that we need to be good at if you want to become, like, a good aimer. And to achieve kind of, like, this level of having, like, a very good aim, sticking to one sense might not be the best idea because we might not be able to develop some sort of, like, proficiency with different muscle groups that we have in our hand. So, for example, when you play with, like, a lower sense in CS, you might mainly use your arm and wrist. And you kind of like neglect using your fingers. And fingers are like extremely important to use for like micro corrections, especially at long range. So with your sense, you might kind of like limit yourself to only working your wrist and arm, kind of like neglecting the fingers. And it's kind of like making you a bit less perfect aimer if you would want to become that type of player. So 
like what happens initially when you change your sense is kind of like you switch the muscle groups. Like if I were to use like a high sense, I would be mainly using my wrist and fingers now in comparison to what will, hap will, will, what will happen on like low sense. So with like higher sense, I'm able to work on my wrist and fingers more, which helps me a lot with getting higher proficiency on them. So I have like a better control over my microbes with fingers and I have like better understanding of my accelerations with my wrist. So it's like easier to do like a flick while using my wrist exclusively. And that's something that I won't be able to really train on low sense. So like ideally you would want to kind of like change your sense from time to time to kind of like develop different muscle groups. So you kind of like have more perfected way of using your hand, if that makes sense. Yeah, it de it, it definitely makes sense to me. And, and I can just to, to give to give everyone an example too. Uh, when I was working with AimLab, we were running these aim aim uh, aim training like competitions, basically uh, pitting the best aims against each other. And and depending on the type of task, um, because different tasks will be like if it's a tracking task or a flicking task, they'll have different you know ranges of motion that you might be expected to kind of be use the mouse within. Some of the players would change their sensitivity by like fifty percent or more. Um, like, you know, 30 centimeters to 60 centimeters, depending on is it a tracking task or, or you know, a static clicking task. And so what that kind of told me, like all the things that Minnie's just saying is that it's not about a consistent sensitivity. It's about being good with all the different techniques. And you can change your sensitivity to train certain specific techniques. And once you're good at all the different techniques, whether it's like fingertips, wrist, arm, all these types of things, as you become a better player, you can bring it all together when you're playing with one sense. You now have the ability to use all of the best techniques for the very specific scenarios. So then you can start to look like Demon 1, where you have like full control. Doesn't matter what's happening, you can always apply the right technique or the right mixture of techniques. And that's what's important, not the sensitivity, but the techniques. Uh, did I get that right? Yes, and okay. also like the better you get, the less sense matters. Like you don't really care much about your sensitivity. You kind of like care more about what is going on the screen and like what you do in like a specific situation. So like a specific technique, what you said pretty much. Awesome, yeah. And I know we'll, we'll get more uh, in depth on some of these topics because uh, later on we'll be talking about sort of training practices, but um, okay, uh, quick thoughts on mouse acceleration. Um, I think a lot of people think again, the same logic, oh, it's inconsistent, so it's bad. Do you have any thoughts on mouse acceleration? It's not very popular these days. So mouse, mouse acceleration, like it's, it's kind of bad when it's inconsistent. Like in CS, if I remember correctly, like mouse acceleration was kind of like affected by FPS you had. If you have like lower FPS, acceleration was a bit different. That's what I saw on like Reddit back in the day. And I was like, okay, it doesn't really make sense to use acceleration. But I felt as well that you might get used to it anyway because you might have like a consistent FPS and frame rate with like better PC. So I was like, okay, if you can make the acceleration curve, so kind of like the way it's kind of like upping your sense consistent, then kind of like might make the sense. Like if your mouse acceleration settings are consistent, then you can learn them as any other sense. It's kind of like you will just get the feeling of the movements on this because it's a consistent acceleration curve, right? So like if it's consistent mouse acceleration that you, for example, can achieve if using like third party programs like Rao Excel, it's fine to use it. But if you use like an acceleration that is kind of like affected by a lot of different factors. So for example, frames inside of the game, when you have like inconsistent frames, then it might not be the best for consistency. It's kind of like more about finding this right acceleration if you would want to use it with like most consistent values that you can get. So you kind of like can learn them better, if that makes sense. It's kind of like you won't really get thrown off by some random more fast motions than you were expecting to do. Just because you have like a weird kind of like acceleration curve that is kind of like jumping around based on some other stuff. Yeah, then that definitely so, makes sense mm -hmm. to me. Um, and and I think that that also brings us nicely into the next myth, um, <laughs> muscle memory. This is something that people throw around a lot. And and again, as soon as when I joined Aim Lab, everyone was like, you know, trolling me whenever I would say it because because they're like, this is not, you know, because also at Aim Lab there are a, a lot a bunch of neuroscientists who are sort of experts on just how all of this stuff works. And they're like, yeah, muscle memory and the way that people are talking about this has no, it's it's not a thing. So can you talk to me about the myth of muscle memory? Okay, so in the training community, it's kind of seen as a meme, as you said. So people usually are kind of like memeing about it when they hear someone saying that muscle memory is important. So that's why they maybe were making fun of you because it's kind of like a meme between us. And it's because it's like very simple. It's like you can't really memorize the same type of motions and do them exactly the same in every single like, like specific situation. 
So, for example, when you play like Valorant, when you have like a certain moment, it's not like you will get the same moment all the time. Like it will always be slightly different. Uh, same goes with your mousepad, you know, like your mousepad gets affected by a lot of factors like humidity, like uh, human oils, for example, you might like split something on your mousepad, you might like worn it out and it will kind of like affect the glide. So you can't really like learn the glide perfectly because it will change all the time. So it's kind of like you can't really memorize the movements as people think, because people think that, you know, like with muscle memory, they can kind of like memorize the same motion over and over again and perform it like always at the same level, which is not true because it will always kind of like differ from scenario to scenario. And as I said before, with our mousepad, we can kind of like get different acceleration based on the humidity and other factors. So generally speaking, like aiming is kind of like more about understanding of the proper technique and kind of like proper acceleration of our mouse. And this acceleration of our mouse will change depending on the out of factors. And it's kind of like something that we can't memorize at all. And as I said before, it's also like you might get like different situations. So we will need to always do some sort of like correction to your aim. So like, even if you will like practice like the same motion all the time, even if your mouse would have the same humidity all the time, not really wearing out like Skypad, for example, like a glass pad, you will still need to do like more corrections to your aim because the situations are not one-to-one -one inside of the game. You know, like sometimes you might peek, the guy might be crouching, he might be standing, he might be kind of like off. So it's kind of like you will need to do some corrections. And in aim trainers, we will kind of like want to learn how to act upon like these corrections better. So kind of like develop some sort of understanding of proper accelerations in certain situations. And it's kind of like more about understanding of the proper technique rather than memorizing like one set pattern of moving our mouse. So that's how it is. It's kind of, it's kind of, kind of like, we can kind of like come back to the sensitivity topic as well. It's kind of like, by changing the sensitivity, you're mainly switching the muscle groups, what I said before. And you kind of like need to get used to using different muscle groups. And as a human, we can kind of like adopt super quickly to them. And we are able to even squeeze like a better benefit from switching because we are able to develop different muscle groups. And it's not like we will forget how to use our arm if we will just commit to using our wrist for like a week. It's like we will just kind of like lose some consistency with it. That's normal, but in like, you know, like maybe two or, or three hours, we will get back the feeling once again. And now we have like better, uh, better really like developed wrist and fingers. So it's kind of like, kind of like misconception people have that muscle memory is like a real thing, but it's not really like a real thing because aiming is not like a sequence type of thing that you can memorize. It's not like when you play some sort of like Tetris game and you need to kind of like memorize the sequence that you need to click like certain numbers like and stuff like that. It's like a different type of thing. It's like more about applying the right concepts in like right places and while doing some corrections into our aim. And we can't really memorize the corrections because they will always be different. All said. Okay, next one, uh, myth number three. Aim trainers are a lousy way to practice aim for in-game performance. Uh, that's like a common one. A lot of people think that aim trainers are useless because you would want to play the main game. And that's true. Like aim trainers are kind of useless if you think like in this kind of like way that like you want to be good at the game. Like if I want to be good at the game, I would mainly play the game to be good at this game. That's true. So we can get very good at the game by playing the game alone. I think Simple from CS is like a very good example. He has like, I don't know, 20k hours in CS. Just playing CS alone and it's like very good at CS. That's kind of like a prime example on how we can get very good just by playing the game. Game Or for example, Zaiwu, he's just playing the game as well, not really using like any aim trainers. And it's like one of the best players if like not top two right now alongside uh, Simple, right? So a lot of people might think that, yeah, it's super important to play the game alone. And they think that aim trainers might be useless because people can get very good without them. That's true. They can get good without them. We have good examples. But when we have aim trainers, you're able to kind of like improve faster if we use like right tools. Like if we will play our main game alone, kind of like take some moments from our game, okay? In this moment, I kind of like like at doing micro adjustments and we train this inside of the game. We can also isolate it to like a different or like next level inside of aim trainer and kind of like speed up the progress. So a lot of people have this misconception that they think that you need to play like aim trainer for like five hours a day to develop like a good aim for your game. It's not true because aim trainers are like more often like a supplement rather than substitute for your in-game practice. With aim trainers, you're able to isolate stuff without downtime. And this way you're able to improve at a faster rate in comparison to just using the in-game tools at times, because there's like the downtime part, but it's like a part of isolation and you can kind of like practice the same motion over and over again without any problems. And in game, it might be different. Sometimes it's not possible to train like a specific motion over and over again, because it's like different type of demands in the inside of the game, like positioning, cross replacement and stuff like that. So 
Like internals are like a good way of speeding up our improvement, but they shouldn't be like kind of like overlooked and and people can't really like say that those should be used instead of playing the game. Like it's always important to play the game. We can get good by playing the game alone, but we can also get good at playing the game with using aim trainers at even faster rate because we can isolate certain things. So that's that's what aim trainers are, like isolation tool that allows us to perform better when we use like right tools and right scenarios. Yeah, I th and I think uh, that, that's also something that if, if, if someone's listening and, and already not sort of convinced uh, of that, I think as we as we get further into uh, into our chat and we start talking about how we sort of categorize aim um, and how, you know I think then it will become clearer because then it's like oh now I understand I'm going into the gym and I'm not just going to the gym but I'm doing you know back biceps or you know I'm doing you know push pull split you know like you know start, you start to understand sort of how 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 you should program based on on what your actual needs are because you can define those those needs and I think that's again an, an issue for a lot of people is how do I define like what I'm even supposed to be doing. Um, so next, next myth. Um, oh yes, this is a good one. Um, <laughs> what do you think people get wrong with warm up? Because I've I've seen you on Twitter as well. Um, you know, uh, you, you know, chiming in when people sort of will throw their warm up routines and they're really rigorous. You know, what like what's the deal with warm? -up? How do we warm up correctly? What are people doing wrong? I feel like people have this like misconception and they can kind of like differentiate warm up to like practice. They kind of like don't see the difference between these two. And a lot of players think that doing like a one hour of warm up will help them with getting good at the game. So a lot of players have this like programs that they do like one hour of training before playing the actual game. And they think it's like a warm up because they are doing it before the game. When in fact it's more of like a training because it's kind of like a longer period of time that you spend perfecting like certain motions. And, you know, if you will spend like one hour warming up for your game, then inside of the game, you might feel tired because you were playing like for an hour before playing the game. You might overthink your aim a bit more because you were like doing some certain like things like aiming, like concepts, like flicking between bots. You might expect some sort of like performance based on your warm up. And then you will kind of like feel too tired and kind of like just messed up with your form. And, in, and usually it's like kind of like leads to you, leads you to the belief that warming up is useless. And that's why like some people might drop the idea of like warming up just because they are doing like a very bad warm up, which you can't really call a warm up. It's like more of like a training when you do it for like one hour. Like a warm up usually has like a goal of kind of like getting you ready for the game that you will be doing or like an activity. And to get ready, you simply need like maybe five or 10 minutes max. It's not like you need one hour to get ready for something. Like you can get the blood flow in maybe in like five minutes of like doing certain things, kind of like warming up. So. Like on Twitter, what you mentioned is like, I saw one guy was like posting his like warm up routine, which was like one hour long. And I was like, why do you even warm up for like one hour when inside of the game, you might be too tired to actually perform and then you like overthink your concepts. So I gave the proposition to use like a shorter warm up with like 10, maybe 15 minutes with the goal of kind of like getting you ready for the game while also kind of like helping you out developing some sort of uh, aim techniques. And for that specific reason, I've made like a, my own kind of like routine for warm up for Valorant. It's called Valorant Ramp Warm Up. It's kind of like mixing up the concept of warming up for the game and developing our skills long term. Since a lot of people like to train for like one hour before the game and then they kind of kind of like have the very bad in-game results, I've decided to kind of like combine the training with the warm up. So I decided to make like a short 10, 15 minute training playlist that is kind of like mixing up the concepts of getting the feeling down of our mouse movements and then pushing ourselves like slightly more towards the end of the warm up. So then in game, we are able to kind of like squeeze more opportunities. And so in long term, you're able to kind of like develop these techniques better if, you, if we are using this like warm up on daily basis. So yeah, I think that the main misconception is like people think that warm up is also like one or two hours long. It's not like it should be short. Like you need to just be active like get some activity going and then you can like play the game instantly without really getting too tired while farming up. So that's, that's the thing. Yeah. And, and I'll, um, I'll make sure to, to leave the link of that in the, of the wrap warm up in, in the uh, description on, on YouTube and on, on X, I'll, I'll put it in, uh, in the comments or, or I'll, I'll find somewhere to, to stick it, but likely the comments below the video. Um, cause that's, a, that's a really good warm up. I've, I've done that too. It's, it's really engaging too, because it's, uh, a, a lot of programs will have, you know, you'll, you'll do, let's say a task multiple times, but it's just, I think, well, like 15 tasks and 15 minutes, you just go through task, task, task. So everything's, you know, it's different every minute, which, which feels a lot more engaging too. Um, so it's, it's way more enjoyable. So definitely, yeah, strong recommend for me. I really enjoyed the ramp, ramp warm up. Um, okay. 
Um, let's see. Next one. So four, so 400 or 800 DPI is, is better. Um, it, it seems like to be a standard and it seems to be something that's been sort of left. It's like a leftover, maybe traditionally, because so many pros have like the old 1.6 pros, you know, obviously back then mice were lower DPI in general. Um, but does that make any sense? What's the best DPI? What's the best DPI? It's like very hard to say. To be honest, like what I believe in and what I saw on YouTube as all of the videos that are kind of like comparing DPIs is that with higher DPI, you have like less input delay. And for example, when you think of DPI, DPI means dots per inch. So 400 DPI essentially means that it generates like 400 dots per inch, right? So like with higher DPIs, it generates like more dots per inch, which makes it like more precise. It's kind of like skipping less frames. So a lot of players kind of like made a switch to 800 DPI, especially Valorant players. They usually play like 800 and 1600, uh, just because there's like less input delay. And so they can kind of like squeeze better precision because there's like more dots generated per inch pretty much. So that's like the main reason. And a lot of players in CS, they feel comfortable with their settings, like at 400 DPI, which also makes sense. Like if something works, like it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really like need to be changed, you know? So a lot of players will still stick to like 400 DPI. It's also cool. But it's like worth knowing that with like higher DPIs, you might have like less input delay. So that's why a lot of players are like switching to like higher DPIs nowadays. Yeah, makes makes sense. Um, yeah, higher DPI. I think I've been on always on 1600, 1800 from like 2005. So I'm, I'm used to it, thankfully. Uh, but, but yeah, this actually brings me on to another one too, which is about uh, reaction times and age, because um, similarly, there's this sense that I've had this forever that, oh, you know, when you're young, you have faster reaction times. And so as you get older, you know, you can't aim as well if you're getting older. So what's your feelings about reaction times and the importance of that and, and also age when it comes to being, you know, a very high level aimer? Okay. So like with reaction time, I feel like people really use it as an ex excuse to not really improve. Like a lot of people are like, oh, I have 180 millisecond reaction time. I might not improve as good as the guy with like not 50 millisecond reaction time. And they kind of like use it as an excuse to not train. When in fact, re like reaction time, like raw reaction time is not super important when you play an actual game. Because in actual game, there's like a lot of different factors affecting your reaction time that is kind of like not only re related to your reaction time, like raw reaction time. It's kind of like, sometimes you have like some predictions and based on the prediction, you kind of have like are more ready to react. And then it's like way easier to react even if your reaction is poor because you're ready for it. If you're like unready, then it's like raw reaction time because you need to like react up like upon something that's like, you know, happening out of nowhere. But when you kind of like have the readiness, so kind of like you're ready for certain peak or like certain motion on the screen, like your reaction, raw reaction time kind of like disappears because then it's kind of like more about your application of the proper technique. It's kind of like, yes, it is important, but when you're like ready, it's more about the technique and like execution of the certain movement. For example, simple, like CS player, he has like 180 millisecond reaction time. There's like a lot of players with like way lower, like 150, 140 seconds, milliseconds, and they are not even as fast as simple inside of the game. It's because simple kind of like nailed down the in-game reflexes better. He knows what to expect. He knows kind of like his accelerations of the mouse better. So even if his reaction time is a bit slower, he's still able to execute like a very fast and quick reflexes inside of the game because he has like a higher understanding of the game. He's kind of like more ready to react than others because if you're ready to react, then you don't really involve as much raw reaction time. It's kind of like you react, but it's kind of like within some sort of prediction. So it's not really affecting your performance that much. And I believe like most of the players have like this like 190, 180 milliseconds of reaction time, which is completely fine. Like it might make like a very tiny difference, like a super top level, but for most of the time, it's kind of like not as important and it's not so, some sort of like an excuse to not even train or not even try. Yeah, and there's a, I, I think there's a few uh, quick extra points I can add to that too. Like this idea of like reflexes or trained reflexes versus like raw reaction time. Like if you touch like a really hot pan, you know, you're, you're gonna just instantly pull back. You're not consciously thinking, ow, this is really hot. Let me ungrip my hand. And, you know, it's like it's your brain is already pre-programmed to try to get away from the thing that hurts. 
I think that with all this training, um, like let's say simple as doing this case, he's trained, he's programmed his brain to have these, like these, there's a stimulus in the game and he instantly will respond to it. He's not consciously doing that. It's an intuitive thing that he's trained. And, uh, and so that kind of bypasses that kind of raw reaction thing. It's the same thing if you like trip, you're like, you don't, you're not like, oh, I am tripping. Uh, you, your body's already moving uh, to, to try to save you from falling. Um, so, we, you know, it's just about programming ourselves. So yeah, I think that's, um, I'm glad, I'm glad we, we covered some of those, um, <laughs> with, with that said, I think, uh, unless, um, you feel like, uh, we, we miss any big ones. I think those are a lot of the, the, the kind of bigger misconceptions that, and myths that I could come up with. Mm, for now, I feel like you nailed down like the most popular ones, like the muscle memory definitely is something that people believe in. The sensitivity is also like a hot topic, I believe. Like internet is feeling useless is also super important like in the community like they are not useless because they are not like if you think of them as a supplement that can help you improve faster they are not useless but if you think that of them as a substitute they are useless so you kind of like nailed down like the most of the concepts i believe and so for now i don't really have like anything to add to be honest i don't really have any idea yeah um it's, it's funny <laughs> so because as, as we move into the next sec segment now where we talk about training practices um the first question actually is going to be how do you decide a sensitivity because this is a really 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 common question as well and there's so much like youtube content everyone's made their own little methods of, of how to like pick a sensitivity i'm super curious what based on what we've already said because we've already said that hey sensitivity doesn't really matter technique is what we're trying to train but if if we're looking at someone that's that's a newer player or someone that is trying to they've come back from a long break and they want to start again how do you choose a good sensitivity what is that okay so at first i would want to say that there is there isn't any specific sense that, that I can recommend to like everyone because it's like kind of like individual thing, right? Like something like a perfect sensitivity that will work for everyone doesn't really exist. Like a lot of players are asking me for like a perfect sensitivity and they do believe if they will find this like specific number, all of their like aiming mistakes will kind of like disappear. <laughs> and that's like a common misconception. And for example, like back in the day, there used to be like an ad on TikTok and like on Twitter about some sort of like tool that helps you find like the perfect sensitivity. And those people like fall into that and they thought it would like help them. And it's not really like a good way of uh, working around our sensitivity because like perfect sensitivity doesn't really exist. Like these tools that kind of like help us measure the perfect sensitivity, they're kind of like testing us on different type of scenarios that we won't be really using inside of the game. So it might tell us like the best sense that we perform at in like a specific task inside of the game, but Inside of the Valorant, for example, we might not be able to to have the same sort of task all the time. It's kind of like different speed is there, different acceleration is there, different range is also there. So it's kind of like um, not really helping us that much. Like it can give us like a good sense for like a specific task, but not really for like a specific game that we want to be good at. And I guess a lot of players want to look for like a sense for their game, not for like aim trainers. So those tools are not that good. And also like sticking to one sense, like a second thing. It's also not something that I would do. It's like a poor investment because you are underdeveloping the different muscle groups, something I talked about before. So like you should stop looking for perfect sense. I know some of people will still look for perfect sense even after hearing this, but you should really stop doing it. And maybe they will have a question. So how do I find a sense? Like what do I start with? And the answer is very simple. Like if you play like Valorant or CS and you're kind of like clueless what to kind of like start with, Try to maybe look at the average sense of your like pro players inside of your game and maybe start from there and do some adjustments to it. Like, let's say in Valorant, it would be like 45 centimeters per 360, which I don't know what it is inside of the game, like game volume, because in internet we use this term of describing the sensitivity in like CM per 360. It kind of like means that it takes you like certain amount of centimeters in the mousepad to make like a 360 degree turn inside of the game. It's like a universal way of like showcasing the sense that you use in across the game styles. So, like, a never average sense that people use in, like, FPS games is around, like, 45 cm. You might start from that, like, 45 cm, and kind of, like, try to adjust from it. Like, try to play some games, try to play some death matches, and if you will see that it's too fast, lower it. If you see that it's, like, too, too slow, make it a bit higher. And that should be, like, a good way of, like, starting out looking for, like, a sense. Like, starting out from the most average one that you have inside of the game, based on the pro player settings. Got it. And, and I, I guess, like, a... An extra consideration um, might be that 
you or at least something that i've i've discovered is i switched to a from a very fast sensitivity because i was playing quake like you know again it's like super fast and high time to kill not as much precision like you don't really need first but a precision in the same way and the targets are bigger anyway um so you can have a faster sensitivity and, and get away with it quite nicely but as i wanted to play or kind of level up my mechanics and aim in in, in like you know counter strike or valorant i was like okay i bring you the slower sensitivity here um, so that I can actually incorporate more sort of techniques. Um, so do, do you have like a, well, the range that I saw was 30 centimeters to like 60, seemed like a good kind of window for like tactical FPS where 30 centimeters is really fast. Um, and you know, 60 centimeters is like on the slower end. Does that, does that make, is that like a decent range for someone to like start at if they really have no idea? Yeah, like as I said, like before, like with like FPS games, I feel like like your aim is mostly oriented around, around your crosshair placement. It's kind of like a bridge between your understanding of the game and your aim. It's kind of like if you understand the game, you will know how to place yourself in like certain positions, how to pre-aim. And with good pre-aim, you will be mainly doing like small micro adjustments, like small movements. And those movements are usually easier to do with like a lower sense. So it makes sense that some players might use like 60, 70 CM as like a lower sense in this case, because if they perfected like a certain in-game techniques and like in-game understanding and the crosshair placement, they will not really need to move as much. So it makes sense to use like a lower sense in this case. Also, I think D Demon 1 is using like a lower sense. And yeah. you can like also observe it's like having this like very good crosshair placement. It's like always making him do like only like small motions and like small micro corrections. And those are easier with low sense. So it also kind of like factors to like a consistency in his case. Yeah, that makes that makes complete sense. Yeah, a lot of mastery over all of the techniques. Yeah, it's funny because I've discovered over time I'm like, oh, actually, like if you if you understand how to use a, like a slower sensitivity, it's actually superior because you can do everything with it. Whereas with a really fast sensitivity, you do have limit like inherent limitations. I think to control. Obviously, there are always going to be some outlier individuals. Like for example, in CS, Woxic, I think was like one of those Woxic. outliers. Whereas like his sense to be so fast, but he's able to be very consistent at a high level. But I feel like that is it's something where I think there is it, you introduce some other elements that are challenging too, especially for people that are new. Where okay, now actually the shape of the mouse, the weight, the friction, these things, these like modifying factors start to become more important because it makes it easier or harder to control um, when you have such a fast sensitivity. So. And that's something we'll also talk about in in a bit. Um, do you do you have any any? Is there something you wanted to jump in with there um, before I uh, move to the next? Yes. Yeah, so like according to the sensitivity, like mm -hmm. on paper, I would say high sensitivity is better because it has like less limitation of the range in the in, in the motion. Like you can do much more with higher sense because you can uh, like turn like a lot quicker. You have like a higher speed kind of like uh, that is like there for you. You have like a lot of more options that you can do with high sense. However, it's like so hard to make it consistent, and it really requires like a lot of time. So a lot of players, despite knowing that high sense might be better, they kind of like go lower sense just because they kind of like don't really want to spend as much time trying to make it consistent. Like if you are able to make like a high sense consistent, as consistent as you would make like a low sense, then you might have like a higher skill ceiling because there's like a higher speed you can get. Because with low sense, you can improve your speed to like only like a certain degree. You will always have some sort of like limitation, be it your mouse pad, be it like a certain cap in the speed that you can achieve with the fastest motion that you can do. And with high sense, you are able to move like at a faster rate, but you will need to like kind of like put more emphasis on developing the control over it, which might take some time. That's why some people, instead of like working around this like high sense, trying to make it better, they might prefer to go for like a low sense and kind of like forget about it and like, you know, play and kind of like improve from that and make it like as consistent as possible and as quick as possible. Got it. Okay. Well then, um, so, you know, you've picked a, picked a sensitivity. Uh, we, we got, we, you know, we, we made it there. We picked a, we picked a sensitivity. How do we go about improving, improving our aim? Like what's, what's the starting point? Okay. It depends on our goals. Like if our goal is to improve at the game and if our goal is to improve at the aim trainer, we will use like different ways of approaching our training. So, like at first, like let's say that most of the players here, like listening to us, might want to be good at the game, not in trainer. So they will pick the average sense. Then what I said, they will need to kind of like do some adjustments to it. Of course, they will need to like see if it's too fast, if it's too low. And when they will kind of like settle on something, they need to kind of like identify some of the mistakes that they might have, right? And it's kind of like hard to do it when you don't really have the knowledge. Therefore, like I highly advise looking for some sort of like 
aim training guides. Like they can really like give you some sort of like perspective on what you might struggle with with your sensitivity as well. And for example, you might notice like after playing with your sense inside of the game that you struggle with I don't know hitting moving targets. And then inside of the guide, you might have some sort of like tips how to work on that. So like if you don't really have like any aim coach that can help you or like any friend that knows aim trainers. What I will do to kind of like not waste my time experimenting and kind of like learning things throughout the trial and error to kind of like speed up the improvement, I would go for like reading some sort of guides. And I can recommend like Voltaic guides. Uh, like Voltaic is in like M community that is kind of like focusing on the improvement and educational content. We do have our own AIM team with AIM coaches. I'm also like a member here and we do provide a lot of resources. And those resources are kind of like a knowledge that you can get for free by reading into it. It's kind of like, can really help you understand some of the weaknesses that you might face and how you can counter them. So if I was like new, I picked my sense, I don't really know how to improve my aim further more. I don't have like any friend to help me. I would look into some guides, like Voltaic guides, for example. Gotcha, and, and those, those guys, as you say, that were kind of, you start to gain some knowledge of, oh, these are the different categories of aiming. So like, what is like switching, target switching? What is click timing? What is, you know, static aiming versus tracking? Like you start to get these categories and then you start to, as you're playing, you start to see, oh, okay, this is the kind of category I'm seeing in the game. Oh, my like micro flicks are off or I have that like a good, like first bullet accuracy. But then when, once that target starts to like, you know, dodge, I can't like, my micro adjustments when it's moving that's the struggle so you start to like see the the analog between what's happening in the game and then how you isolate again like going back to the gym example like oh I, you know this is the lat pull down machine because because my my pulling strength is is bad and i need to like isolate you know this overhead strength in this way type of thing um okay i would also want to add something into this topic like as, like uh, we have the guides of course they kind of like explain the concept the categories so as, as you said like tracking flicking stuff like that but we also do have like aiming benchmarks those are divided into these categories so you can like play them get some sort of like score and you can kind of like see the results like which category is the worst in comparison to the other ones at your level so you're able to tell okay i have good flicks but i struggle with tracking or like okay i have good tracking but i struggle with flicks and then you kind of like know what you can train to get better as an fps player and we also do have like valorant uh, aim training benchmarks so they kind of like analyze uh, your aim in context of like categories that you rely on inside of the valorant so like your flicks your micro corrections and your like stability when you like hold angles and stuff like that so like in voltaic you can also find these benchmarks that might kind of like give you some sort of guidance on what you can improve at as like aside from this guide so you can also like test those benchmarks are you are you able to sort of give sort of a like just an example, pro, like kind of program in a sense. Um, like for example, you know, we worked together. Um, I wanted to kind of try out the the voltaic kind of amped program, um, and and you know, you did like an assessment uh, with me, and you sort of highlighted some of my strengths and weaknesses, and then you created a program of like what tasks I would go through. Um, how um, so, so we've we've kind of talked about how someone might understand. Okay, well, I need to work on these these various things. But when you approach building a program for someone, how do you decide how long it should be how much time per day um how many uh let, let's let's say in in my case there's like various skills i have to try to i want to try to work on am i trying to work on all of those skills in like a in like a playlist um you know can you talk, uh, walk us through that process a little bit so usually it's kind of like also doing some sort of interview with a player like i usually want to kind of like ask of the goals that the player might have also like what time he wants to be playing the routines at like the commitment he wants to to kind of like apply as well because some players are super serious they are even like saying yo i can even play for like two hours if you will make it for me i will do it and some are like yo i kind of like play the game a lot i play tournaments a lot i would want to have something shorter like something more focused around the stuff i do inside of the game so like for example in your case maybe one of your goals was to improve like mechanics across all categories then our routines will be kind of like mixing the weaknesses that we have while also kind of like fortifying strengths across different categories. And in other case, like let's say a player that is like playing tournaments would want to have like a just weakness specific from Valorant type of aim playlist. We won't really go across every single topic within this playlist. We will kind of like focus on the things he wants to improve at. And we will kind of, kind of like break down how we can improve those as well by applying the right techniques. So it's kind of like super individual. We usually decide like some sort of like schedule with the player 
that works for like both me as a coach and both for him as a player. So he can kind of like commit to it. And I really want players to kind of like commit to training. Taking break, breaks is super important. So we also account for some breaks. So we kind of like want to plan out that, okay, we will be training this for a week. Then we take like two or three days of break. We will like, you know, introduce some new scenarios to kind of like apply different concepts. It's like we do a lot of like sessions to kind of like summarize our progress and kind of like take some steps together uh, towards like better improvement. It's kind of like a longer process. Gotcha. Okay. I mean, that, that definitely makes sense. Um, okay. So what would be like a good, in terms of like the mental uh, part of, of training, of course, like with anything, there's, there is a mental component. Um, how do you th think about this with aim training? Because because when because I think if anyone's ever watched aim like aim training, it or you know it's it's almost meditative when you kind of like you, you kind of almost want to get into that state where you're you're not like obviously you're you're focused, you have energy to put into the training, but at the same time you're not like focusing over focusing. So how, so what's what's the mental component to all of this? So like I feel like all the players don't really understand like like in order to reach like a high level. Like, especially in something like aim training, which is some sort of like a niche, I would say, like something that we said before as well, like a niche, you really need to like have like a time investment and you really need to put a lot of hours into perfecting your craft. And you really need to like be consistent with your training as well. Like you need to apply routines, you need to be like having maybe some sort of like comfortable sleep as well. Like having some sort of like consistency is super important as then we are able to squeeze like better results. And a lot of players think that it's not really that important and kind of like playing from time to time might help them improve super quickly. So like, it's super important to kind of like have this mental approach of developing some sort of like discipline and consistency. Like all the players are missing on this. They kind of like test aim training for a bit, take a month of break, come back, take a week of break, come back. They don't really like commit to anything specific. And I feel like a lot of top players, including me or Matty Overwatch, who recently won like a Red Bull tournament in US. We are like super, committed into our trainings and we actually kind of like try to squeeze as much as we can with the discipline and we kind of like try to make sure that we always put enough effort to get the best benefits. I also believe that if you would want to be good at aiming, like you won't be able to be satisfied with having like consistency with your aiming when you know you can like push something better. Like it's like what I believe is that when you know that you can reach like a higher level, you will just feel mad that you are not able to get this level without practicing. So it will kind of like lead you to practice more because sometimes you might play, develop some sort of level and kind of like stop playing because you are satisfied. And if you're satisfied by your aiming level and you can be consistent with this aim, that doesn't really mean that you have the highest aim that you can achieve. It's kind of like the best aim you can achieve usually would be something that can only be maintained by the practice. Like for me, like I would want to achieve like a level of aiming that I can't maintain without practicing. And that would be like the perfect aim for me, like an aim that you can't maintain without practicing. If you can maintain your aim without really practicing that much, then you are not really pushing yourself that much and you don't really devote yourself that much into improving. So a lot of players are kind of like find themselves comfortable and they don't really push themselves to the next level like we do in the internet community. So that's the main thing, kind of like adopting this approach of trying to push ourselves, trying to have consistency, trying to kind of like have this discipline going that we kind of like want to maintain a high level with practice, not just reaching a level and kind of like forgetting about aiming. We don't really want to do it. We want to always push it to the next level. Yeah, I love, I love that. I think that's that's actually something that's hard to... I feel it's hard to negotiate that with yourself sometimes. Uh, you know, if like how much focus do I really have? How much energy do I really have? Am I going in to today with with some like specific goals in mind? I, th I think that's actually one of the reasons why um, ha like setting goals is really important in general because and, and also ha not just goals, but having like terms of engagement. So I usually talk about um, like, let's say if, if you're if you're playing ranked to improve, like every day you have to have the, what, what like you have to have a mindset that you've decided upon and you have to make sure that that you're locked into that before you start queuing because if you just queue without a goal or you queue without let's say being mentally in the right space maybe you're gonna you're gonna tilt maybe you're gonna not have as much fun maybe you're not going to actually have high quality practice because that's what we're, we're trying to control those variables and and and, and you're what you're talking about like not having the focus or the energy because you know you don't even know what you're trying to to try to strive for 
yeah you can't you can't imp really improve in that environment so i really love that you brought that point up i think it's like super key um uh and with that said um i think that's a great mental tip but let's talk about some some uh like i guess quick tips when we're looking at some of the aiming categories um as you said a lot of players i think especially if, if they go into the voltaic community and they're looking for some of these guys they're going to see some of these these pointers when it comes to okay we're playing this task and it's to train this kind of skill and these are the things you need to kind of try to do when you're when you're doing this to, to be doing it properly so you get high quality repetitions um but let's go through some of the categories and maybe you know go uh, go with some of your sort of top tips um, when it comes yeah. to some of this so we can start with tracking um okay so like usually it would kind of like depend on the type of task you play so we won't really focus on like a specific task because for like each task we might use like a different techniques because you know on some tracking tasks you might have like a blinking target so it's like it's moving and boom teleporting somewhere it's like a different type of tracking than when you like just track like an object like this moving like a very long strafe so we will kind of like focus on the categories instead of like certain scenarios because each task has like different uh, way of approach. So when it comes to like tracking, for example, I guess the foundation of tracking will be smoothness. And with smoothness, kind of like the main points are to try to develop some sort of like proficiency with being relaxed while trying to track the target, like trying to squeeze as little power into our mouse as possible. So we kind of like don't really tense that much while trying to track because when you kind of like squeeze our mouse super tightly, we really tend to like shake more because we have like a kind of like death grip on our mouse. So usually in like Voltaic communities, we do recommend players to be more relaxed when they play tracking scenarios, when they are building up this smoothness skill. So they can kind of like have this like smooth, relaxed aim rather than this like shaky and highly tensed aim. And what I usually tell players, that includes also you, is to kind of like think of your mouse as an egg, for example, because egg is like super fragile. So it's, it's kind of like when you squeeze the egg, it might just like destroy itself, right? So like if you will think of your mouse as an egg, you won't really try to squeeze it that much. And then you kind of like apply the proper mindset for developing smoothness better because you have this like belief that, okay, my mouse is an egg. I need to be holding like firmly, kind of like gently. So it's kind of like helping a lot with like smoothness. So it's kind of like a mental tip that can help you out with developing this like foundation within tracking. And uh, I want to, mm -hmm. oh, go ahead. So I wanted to also like mention flicking, but if you have something to add, um, yeah, yeah, okay so, something uh, on the tracking thing that I just remembered that you told me too that that is actually super helpful with that is uh, you told me to rebind the fire key to like like a control or something on the keyboard. So there's less, even less tension on the mouse. And I've actually found that this is really helpful because even though you are going to be holding, like like my fire button is mouse one. So I'm going to be holding that in the game. Um, you might think that, oh, well, you should want to train like that too. But actually I found like way better results from, from just being able to focus only on just having the, as little tension on the mouse as possible and not worrying about like holding mouse one. So that's... That's another hot hot tip, actually. I feel like the tracking is is rebind the fire key to to something on the keyboard, like control or spacebar or something. Yeah, that's like a very good approach because then you can kind of like focus only on the technique itself and on the foundation itself. Because like let's say you work on your tracking smoothness for Valorant, like in Valorant it won't really hold most one entire time when trying to track the corners, for example. Because when you have like a cross replacement, you might like trace the corner with your smooth aim without really holding most one. So it's also not like applicable that much into FPS games. It's kind of like building up this like basic skill of having this like smooth sort of out motion on the mouse, like the most relaxed grip that we can get. And when we don't really apply the pressure by clicking mouse one, we can kind of like focus more on having this feeling down. So that's also like the big reason why it's like recommended sometimes. It's kind of like optional, but it's recommended to maybe bind your key to like a different, um, like firing key to like a different keyboard key so you can hold it instead of mouse one. Uh, speaking of this, it's also kind of like applicable to target switching tasks because I also wanted to kind of like talk about flicking as a whole. Like very briefly, it's like a lot of things that we can talk about when it comes to, like, when it comes to like flicking, the technique and stuff like that. But like kind of like the main component of flick, which is like initial flick, usually has to be quicker. So we want to like flick as fast as possible to the target. And usually the landing on the target is like shaky. And kind of like the main goal to improve our flicks will be to have the control upon our landing. And when we use like left control as our fire key on, for example, target switching scenarios, which are flicking scenarios, in where you need to like flick and like track object for a second, like you can, you're able to kind of like focus more on this having this like smoother landings. Like if you were to like 
flick must run all the time, you might like apply too much force into the flick, and it will kind of like pollute the perception of the proper technique. And you know, like in reality, when you will kind of like develop this technique while holding this like left control, for example, like always having this like smooth landings, then you will build up the habit. And even if you will try to click, it will be like way easier to comprehend it because you have this like feeling of having your flicks more controlled. So this tip of having like left control is also applicable for switching tasks uh, because we can work on our flick landings, which are super important. Like our flick to track skills, like flicking and then trying to track with smooth aim. It's super important to have this like transition down and it can help a lot mm, so like with flicking it's kind of like more about learning the smooth transitions so we have like easier time in correcting our aim because in game like we have like in aim trainers we have like categories like of flicking we have like static and dynamic in game people are usually not static so when we play static we kind of like train our initial flick accuracy and like a micro to like a static point in game we need to be able to flick and micro to like a moving target so it's kind of like better to use like target switching to improve at that specific thing and you can also like get like a higher value of trying to have like smoother landings on this type of tasks because we are able to read the movement of the target better because when you have like a fast flick and then it's like a slower landing we are able to kind of like see the movement better and it's easier to adjust because if you were to like flick super quickly then usually it's like a shake at the end and this shake kind of like makes us having like a harder time doing like a proper micro correction so i believe like having some sort of like precise target switching tasks in where we can kind of like focus on having our flex landings down might help us way more inside of the game because we will kind of like learn the skill of the accelerating rather than just playing static in which we kind of like always do like a micro to like a static point if that makes sense yeah definitely um and it's gonna make more sense probably to me because i've because I've, I've you know been d like doing all of these things and and i would assume there's gonna be a lot of people that are newer to to all of this that are listening to this uh and and sort of wondering like more about uh the, the just how to how to improve their aim and I'll, th you know there'll be some you know video footage up as as mini is talking you'll probably see that and you know i can add that in post that should hopefully help the visualization of some of these things um but you know one thing i have to say in terms of these categories that really um i didn't think about uh was click timing because uh and this is something where you know you showed me some tasks that were good for this um, I can't remember what any of the tasks are called off the top of my head, but essentially, you know, you have these, these, these like small kind of balls, like floating around the screen and they're moving in different like directions, possibly speeds and you, you flick to it. And in my brain, I would normally approach that task, be like, oh, I just have to flick to the, to the, to the, to the, you know, the, the sphere and then click it. Mm -hmm. But with the click timing, you know, you, you show me, okay, well, you're going to, these tasks are for click timing practice. So you want to flick slightly ahead of the direction of the target. And then wait for it to come into your crosshair and then click. And then, then I, as I started practicing this, I was like, oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense because what do you do like most of the time? Like what like with good crosshair placement, it's a lot of it's about, you know, you're expecting that I'm gonna place my crosshair this far from the angle because I'm gonna expect someone to move into it. And I just have to all I have to do if I if I get that prediction right, someone moves in, in front in like in front of my crosshair, is to click at the right time. And a lot of pro players are really, really, really good at this. And these are like frags that you ha like kind of have to get almost, they're, they're, you know, because you have the advantage. Maybe that, you know, they have a bit of peak as advantage. But if you have a good off angle and these types of things, you've got a really, really good position to get maybe multiple kills. So, so you should be getting those with high levels of consistency. But it's really hard to actually practice that skill in the game. You know, sure, you can go into deathmatch and then just like hold a corner and just like wait, but someone's going to shoot you in the back. You know, like you can't really isolate that skill very well, but it's so important. And so I found that that was actually very, very helpful to me, especially playing, you know, Valorant or CS to be to be able to isolate that skill. So uh, and it's, it was also the least intuitive in the sense that, again, like I'm looking at this task and I'm, I'm thinking I just have to flick to this this orb and, and shoot it. But but it took me a while to adjust and be like, oh, okay, I've got to flick in front. And then what my brain was doing as well is I'm like, okay, I actually have to confirm that it's still going in the same direction. It's going to go into the crosshair and I actually have to have really high accuracy. So I, I need to have like as close to 100% as I can on this task. So now all of the aiming I'm doing is super deliberate. And that's kind of one of the things we described about Demon 1 earlier. And, and if you watch him, everything is super deliberate and like a little bit slowed down compared to everybody else yet he's also so fast and accurate so so it's training that like ability to be deliberate and make those small adjustments if you have to um so i found that that was like really really important so i don't know if you want to add anything about click timing but i think it's super important for 
tactical FPS yeah. players. Click timing is super important for sure. Like with click timing, it's kind of like with time you want to make it so we are able to kind of like flick into like a moving target and click as you said. It's kind of like an end outcome. So like if you are trying to achieve the end outcome of like flicking and clicking instantly, you might develop like a lot of bad habits of like rushing your shots, not really taking time to visually see what's going on with the target. So initially you would want to learn as you would inside of the game, like kind of like positioning yourself better for like each target so you can time your shot without really like effort. Like if, if it's like kind of like, when you like have like a good crosshair placement, good off angle, there's like less effort needed to kill a target that's like going into your crosshair because you're ready for it and it's like just one click. And if you can't really get this like one click down, then like working on this by kind of like placing your crosshair in front of the target that's moving can help you a lot with like getting the sense of like timing your clicks better. And later on, you're able to kind of like decrease the leading distance that you have. Uh, before like timing the click because like initially you might like put your crosshair like super away from the target that's moving and he might change direction so like ideally you would want to learn how to like decrease this leading distance so target is like always kind of like moving into the crosshair kind of like almost aiming into the, into the target so kind of like the first step to achieve that will be to at first get the sense of click timing with our crosshair placement as well trying to time the shots even with like a very long leading distance and later on kind of like working on decreasing it to a point in which our click timing looks like we are almost on the target all the time. I remember I was like playing some click timing tasks within our sessions and I was kind of like showcasing to you how I'm able to kind of like flick almost in front of the target, like kind of like almost in the target and click instantly. And I always kind of like have like a very tiny like leading distance, not like a super big leading distance. So like with time you want to like decrease this leading distance as much as possible. So then you kind of like flick and click instantly. Uh, and so people can't really like notice that you're even leading in the first place. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's that's the thing. That's why in my head, I'm like, oh, I just flick the target and click it. But I hadn't developed those all of the skills yet. It's kind of like uh, something I learned from um, uh, Gio a long time ago. Gio is like another person that actually ended up working, working for AimLab, but, but he was uh, a really good static uh, clicking player. Uh, and he... He had this thing called Bard Pill. His, his nickname is Bardos, and he has this YouTube channel. And 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 the Bard Pill is essentially this idea that okay, you know, you have to try to achieve as high accuracy as possible with static clicking. And so you want to do a you want to train each movement. You want to break each thing up into the, into segments. So you've got the initial flick from one target to the next, and then you see where the crosshair is, and then you maybe need to do a micro correction. And then after the micro correction, you have to kind of, kind of do the confirmation in your head: is the crosshair over the target? Okay, yes, cool, I click. If not, I micro adjust again. And you have you slow the process down. And so you're you're slowing each piece down. I think he would just he described it like imagine, you know, you're you're training like you know, playing a musical instrument. You know, you start really slow with these techniques and you get better and better and it gets quicker and quicker. And then you know, to, to the untrained eye, um, like you're describing, you like you're not gonna be able to see that someone has all these skills and they're putting all these things together. You just see, oh, he just clicked that thing really well. Um, so, <laughs> um, That's how it is. so, uh, any, any other, um, cause, cause I know you, you know, we could kind of go even more in depth and break down all like, uh, all of these skills down into even like smaller pieces, but I uh, think you feel like we've covered like the broad range of some of these, these different categories, you know, tracking, switching, flicking, click timing. Yeah. Like be honest, I would kind of like wanted to mainly talk about like tracking as the foundation of smoothness and flicking as mm. flicking, because those are like kind of like the main things that we'll kind of like rely on. And from like good tracking, we have a lot of different subcategories from like good flicking. We have a lot of different subcategories that are kind of like combining each other. So I feel like going over like every single concept right now might not be the best idea. It's kind of like, we will get kind of like, we will kind of like overflow with the information at this mm -hmm. point. And if someone is interested in kind of like learning more about like this uh, certain like categories of aiming, like what comes from tracking, like what type of categories you might get out of tracking, like what types of categories you might get out of flicking, might look, look up some sort of like benchmarks that, I, that we've mentioned previously, like Voltaic ones or, or like reverse act ones, or there's like a lot of uh, benchmarks like that are there for, for people to try out with the explanations for like each category. Awesome. All right. Well, in that case, let's uh, let's keep things moving. We can talk about gear quickly because that's something that we haven't talked about. And it's so funny because it's kind of like you were saying before where people look for the magic bullet. It's like, okay, what's the perfect sensitivity? And it's it's also the the obsession too. It's like, oh, if I had a different mouse, I would, you know, aim better. And, and you know, it might be, you know, true in certain respects. A different mouse shape can be helpful, but 
so like in the modern era, we have a really amazing, you know, technology like sensors on pretty much like all of the, the, the new mice that, that we have. So we don't really have a limitation in terms of the technology per se these days. So it's more about, okay, the shape, the size, the weight, the, the friction of the skates and the interaction between the skates and also the friction of the pad and, and, you know, the dynamic friction versus the static friction. There's all these little things to play, like grips as well, all these things you can play around with. So given that that's, you know, uh, such a huge, huge kind of area to, to discuss, what what's your take on how important gear is and what people should be thinking about when they're actually trying to, to improve their aim? So when it comes to the gear, I would say, like the most important thing is something that you've mentioned already. So like the good shape of the mouse, like we might have like large hands, so we might not be suited as well for like a small mouse. So we kind of like might have some sort of like performance dips just because we feel uncomfortable. So it's kind of like super important to find this like good shape that is kind of like matching our hand size. Same goes for grip. Like we tend to have our like natural grips. Like some people prefer palm grip, some people prefer claw grip, fingertip, some sort of like deviations from these grips. And sometimes like the mouse that we have might force some sort of grip onto us and it might feel very uncomfortable. So it's like super important to look for the mouse that is kind of like fitting our hand size and kind of like our expectations. Like we kind of like need to think, okay, what grip I would want to use? Like, do I want to use palm grip? Do I want to use claw grip? Okay, I know what grip I want to use now. Like what mouse should I get? And then maybe what I would consider the most is like the shape and also like the size of the mouse. Like I will probably like measure my hands and kind of like maybe look up the Rocket Jump Ninja guide on how to like look for a mouse, for example. He's like a mouse reviewer. He had he had his like own site with like a lot of mice's recommendations, and like on his site you can like put your hand measurements and kind of like gives you some sort of like idea what you can get for certain grip and certain uh, hands that you have. So that's what I would do first, like kind of like looking for like a good mouse that is kind of like uh, fitting my needs, so I can actually squeeze the most out of my performance. So for example, I'm usually using like a smaller mice. Oh, maybe I can't really show it. It's like HTX from Jewels. It's like a very small mouse. Like it's like 36 grams, I believe. I also use like another small mouse, which is like HTS as well. So like I found my comfort with smaller mice just because I have like smaller hands. My hand measurements are like 18 by nine. And I use like claw grip. And on this mouse, I can like use it very, like with like a high comfort so since i have like a lot of comfort i can like kind of like focus on the aim more than than the mouse and peripherals that they have so it's kind of like important to look for this comfort with the mouse and goes like mouse pad it also kind of will depend on the game you play like a lot of players in tech fps will prefer using a control pad because they have like better stopping power it's easier to do like micro adjustments with skates it's kind of like a very broad topic so it's very hard for me to like give you some sort of like recommendations because each player has like different needs, like different demands, like he wants to play different games. So like, I guess like the most important thing that you would want to look at in the first place will be your mouse grip uh, and your kind of like shape you would want to use and the size of the mouse as well. And maybe then mouse pad and then you can kind of like go in depth into like looking for some skates, like testing out different stuff, you know, it's kind of like, like a secondary thing after you get like a good mouse. And I, I like, uh, you know, how you're putting a lot of emphasis around the comfort because because I think it's really easy to because, you you know, you might not know anything at all about what's good or what's not. And you maybe you've, you've tried very few mice. So it's, it's kind of hard to if you have no knowledge to really know what is it? What does it feel like if I try like a mouse is like shape that's totally different? And, I, I you know, my personal experience as well has been I've tried so much over the years and I have I have slightly smaller hands than you actually. And and uh, I've tried to 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 use like bigger mice because I'm like, oh, you know, this, some of these mice are really cool. Like I always wanted to be able to use uh, the the Superlight, the the Logitech G Pro Superlight, because I'm like, I, I like, I kind of like how the shape feels um, in terms of like the the palm grip, but but my control of it, like my ability for my natural grip, is it's not very good. And when I use like a much smaller mouse, like you know, like the the Starlight uh, Twelve, for example. It's this really, really small mouse, but like I feel like it feels really comfortable. So even if I'm aiming poorly with it, it feels the most comfortable. And so that then I started to realize I keep going back to this mouse because it it feels the most comfortable. Maybe I should just improve my my mouse control technique. And that, <laughs> and, yeah, and, and, and so it's, <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's yeah that's that's what I realized is that I'm, I was being lazy and I was like looking for the the quick the quick solution.
solutions. It's like sometimes when people have like shakiness inside of the game, instead of like trying to work on it, they kind of like go for the low sense because they think it will be kind of like helping them instantly. And yeah, it might help them for a bit, but later on they will realize that they got used to the low sense and they are still shaking. So it's kind of like a low, short-term solution that is not really like helping you that much in like a long term. And we usually would want to look for some like long-term solutions. And a long-term solution in this case is finding like a comfortable mouse so we can kind of like forget about it. like. Like forget about peripherals and like focus on our aim techniques of what you said pretty much yeah yeah and it's it's funny because it's again like it's something that's it, i don't know it, it's it's a difficult topic because it because everybody i mean you're you do have these emotional attachments to your performance in your game and so when when you're in a frustrating position and you're like you're not getting the performances that you want and you're kind of and you're like missing shots and that doesn't feel good doesn't feel very good and so you might be like oh well maybe if i just did something different change something it's kind of like the same situation when you just want to change a player in a team as opposed to maybe working on some of the the, the fundamental aspects to make the team better um you yeah you can have a short-term benefit from doing that but the long term is probably going to be worse because you're not really building something um in that in that place you're just swapping something for something else so yeah, definitely a good way to think about it. Find the comfort, um, respect your natural grip, and then just figure out what techniques you need to improve, much like the, the things we've been discussing, I think, previously. Um, any any other things, like when it comes to gear, um, any other things that you think are important to, to talk about? Mm, to be honest, not really. Like I would say mouse and mouse, but it's like the most important. Like, I've never really, like, looked much into keyboards. However, like, recently, I've got Wooting 60 HE, which is, like, a keyboard that almost every single pro uses nowadays. And I now realize that maybe keyboard also makes, like, a difference when it has, like, less delay. So maybe looking for the keyboards with the lowest input delay that you can get, it doesn't have to be Wooting, it can, it can be, like, any other um, company, might be also helping you a lot with, like, in-game movement. So maybe looking up for this, like, newest peripherals with, like, the lowest delay, with the highest quality might help you as well. But it's not something that you have to have, you know? Like, I used to play with, like, very bad, poor keyboards, and I was still being able to play relatively well because, like, ultimately, like, I'm aiming with my mouse and my my mouse pad rather than my keyboard when I play in trainers. Like, in-game, I do use my keyboard, so I believe, like, when you play actual games, maybe looking up for the lower input might be helpful. But when you aim train, like, focus only on your aim without really, like, involving any movement into it, then... Like focusing on the mouse and the mouse pad will be like the top priority. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to check that out because I haven't thought about that either. The keyboards. Um, right. So we can move into sort of the the final part of the of the the podcast today. Uh, had a bunch of community questions. You know, selected uh, a few that we can kind of go through and get your thoughts on. Um, f first one actually uh, is actually gonna be from me because. Although that's kind of weird because I've been asking all the questions already, but but uh, a common question I do see that I was surprised not to see in the comments, but I get it on my stream or like whenever you know whenever I'm looking at um, or talking about aim trainers uh, and and just aiming in general, um, should you focus on the target or the crosshair is something that I hear a lot. Okay, it's like a very common question. I feel like in certain situations you might focus more on the crosshair rather than the target. So for example, when you have like long range duel, you might focus more on the crosser because you need to be more precise. And like medium to like short range duel, you might focus more on the target because you want to see the movement. But it's kind of like hard to switch our focus like instantly from crosser to the target, crosser target. So ideally, like I always recommend people to just focus on the target because then they can kind of like read the motions of the target, they can see it better. And then they can kind of like apply the proper technique and kind of like see their crosser within their peripheral vision. And when we play like tech FPS games, for example, we need to be able to use our peripheral vision to kind of like be able to see the radar, be able to see our HP, be able to see the entire map. So kind of like learning how to use our peripheral vision also while in training might help us inside of the game as well. Not only with our aim, but also with this like peripheral, peripheral awareness or whatever you call it nowadays. So like, I feel like the best way will be to kind of like focus on the target all the time. And maybe in like long range duels, you might focus on that crosser, but since you might forget about it, just try to always prioritize looking at the target because then you can kind of like make your crosser go into the target with your like peripheral vision. And it's like easier to read the movement of the target when you look at the target. So it's better. I feel like it's a better solution to just look at the targets. Awesome. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great answer. That, that's a great answer. Um, okay, so actual community questions now. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay. Cine, Cine from Voltaic asked, um, perhaps more on the philosophical side, but maybe a topic could be innate talent versus hard work when it comes to improving your aim. 
Okay, Sydney, I know him. <laughs> nice question. <laughs> okay, so like maybe at first we would want to kind of like describe what talent means, like what we mean by talent. For me, talent, like like what I believe talent is, like in terms of like in training, is kind of like an ability to focus on the right things in the right time. So when I have like a talent, I'm able to kind of like focus on the right things from the start. So I don't kind of like waste my time playing some sort of like tasks that might kind of like make my improvement a bit longer. So for example, when you kind of like start in trainers, you might maybe start playing this like very popular task like grid shot and you will spend maybe like 100 hours playing grid shot. Well, I will spend like 100 hours playing something else because I know that grid shot might not help me the best because, you know, we have like big targets and in game you don't really have this big target. So it doesn't really make sense to do it. So I play something else, you play something else. And then we have the same amount of hours, but I might have like way better results just because I kind of like focus on the right things. And I believe that what talent is like in aim trainers like people are able to kind of like put their focus in the right things like a talented person kind of like knows the road from the start or at least is able to tell the better solutions in comparison to others which makes them kind of like while putting the equal effort they're able to squeeze better benefits just because they focus on the good things that's what they believe in yeah that's i think that's a great way to put it too because yeah there's getting better is like so many different things and all of them can be really hard whether it's just like you say like picking the right focus versus because that, that like some people are very good at that and then some people are so aimless in how they approach things or being mm-hmm. like some people are like more analytical or some people can put more they have more focus um that they can apply that's more natural like everyone has there's so many different things you can be better at or worse at than 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 uh than somebody else and i actually loved something you said earlier that people tend to use let's say the reactions thing because that's can that could be considered you know oh it, this, this this is a natural talent of someone people do, do use these things as excuses not to figure out the path to get better with what they have um so yeah that's that's, that's another great answer um yeah that's true okay um i think we we kind of answered this one already ah so eric Maybe we can add something to this i'm sorry oh yeah no go Maybe ahead we can go add ahead. something to this topic because like this kind of might relate to some like aiming types. Like you mentioned this like raw reaction time thingy. We might have some sort of like natural strengths. So it might kind of like affect our aiming style in game. I know that some people might be having this question like what aiming style might be better than the other one. Or, like which one is like more consistent. And a lot of them might kind of like force like a certain playstyle just because they saw that it's consistent. And like in the natural way of thinking, they are maybe more suited to like a different type of playstyle. So like sometimes like you have like a player with like a very low reaction time and he might be like very good with like his snappy flicks and then he will saw like a player like Ye that is like using like a very smooth aim and he will kind of like switch off his natural strengths to Ye playstyle and kind of like turn off his natural abilities. And then it might kind of like slow down his improvement. And the idea is that at the top level you have like a place for all type of aimers. You have like smooth aimers, you have like... Uh, snappy aimers so there's like a place for all type of aimers here and some players feel like they need to commit to like a certain play style no matter how good they are at something else just because it's like more consistent and it's not really true because they can make their own play style like way better so sometimes like playing around our natural strengths makes more sense even though you might not believe that it's the most consistent way because later on we can kind of like squeeze better benefits because we kind of like work around our natural uh, capabilities and like while working on some like weaknesses as well. So I know that some players might ask which playstyle is the best. I would say try to commit to your natural playstyle and try to kind of like work around your natural abilities and work on your weaknesses at the same time. As there's like place for any type of aimer at the top level. I, I, yeah, I love that point too because sometimes to like make a similar point, um... I, I point to like anime because an, a lot of anime they they, they kind of they, they they show you the what like the path to mastery kind of looks like in the sense that when you're a beginner you don't really have an identity per se you're just trying to learn all of the fundamentals but then sort of over time as you get like you know higher and higher kind of like level of power the, your identity becomes more and more prevalent on top of the fundamentals and then it gets to a point where you're you're actually developing something that's completely unique to you and I think this this describes like getting good at pretty much anything. Um, we all have some of those natural talents, but y- unless you're going to spend all the time like training the fundamentals and and uh, like rediscovering your identity th- like after doing that and how that integrates into those fundamentals, you you if you don't do the hard work to, to do that, you're not going to really see what you're capable of um, and how and how you know you could make something completely unique. You don't. It's it's not sure you follow 
it's like the fake it till you make it thing. And, and this was really helpful for me getting good at commentary too. I was like, okay, I'm going to look at, um, I like, I, I create this huge like list, this like spreadsheet of like, here are all these, here are all the skill sets that I think are involved in commentary. Here are all the people that I feel like do each thing individually the best. I focus like really hard on those things, broke it all down into fundamentals. I would try to like copy what these people were doing. And then over time through practice and understanding the fundamentals, eventually my own style started to appear um, and I was no longer like copying anyone anymore. Um, and I think that's another way to put what, what you kind of uh, were describing there into words as well. I think it's a really good point. Um, okay, so uh, Eric Guan or Wolfram on Twitter says, or X uh, uh, says, does crosshair shape or color actually matter? Crosshair shape, like I think he meant like in training because like in name training it might matter, I would say. It's like in terms of practice, like if you use like a crosshair with like a gap, like you might use in game. So like there's like a gap in the middle. Like, you might spend more time confirming your shots than you would with, like, a dot crosser that is, like, around the size of the target or, like, a plus crosser without the gap inside of the of the, of the the crosser. So, like, a lot of players in name trainers do prefer using, like, crossers that are, like, smaller without really, like, any gap inside so then they can actually, like, shot faster and kind of, like, make the aiming faster this way as well because then when they, like, arrive on the target, they don't really have to, like, check if the target is in the gap to fire the shot. It's kind of, like... I feel like Shroud like also mentioned that he's using like a bigger crossers in the game because then when he flicks to someone, he's kind of like shit shooting instantly. And if he were to use like a small crosser, then he would like spend more time visually seeing what's going on before shooting, which could like kind of like cost some duels for him. It's the same for aim training, like with the gap in the inside of the crosser, you might be able to spend more time on the target after the flick, which might not really help you out developing this kind of like proficiency of like flicking and confirming quicker as you would want to do inside of the game. So using like a crosser that is like having like no gap might really help you a lot with like aim training as well. Gotcha. So so that's actually really interesting too because um, I noticed and and this is something you you know you, we we talked about too when um, when you were co doing some coaching with me um, and and I noticed that with again looking at Demon One he uses the tiny dot crosser when he's when he's playing and and uh, I found that really interesting because it doesn't seem like it seems like there might be more downside than upside, but he's so good. I don't know. <laughs> he's obviously amazing <laughs> with it. So do you, do you have any any thoughts about like the dot crosser in Valorant? Because it is quite popular. A lot of people do it. And again, people are going to be copying stuff that he does because yes. he's he's an absolute beast. So yeah, dot crosser like provides you like more precision. Like you are able to see more errors with your aim. So it's kind of like easier to get some sort of like feedback of what you're doing wrong. So for example, if you were to practice with like a dot crosser, then you can kind of like improve maybe at a faster rate because you'll be able to see more problems with your aim. However, if your dot is like too small, when you like play like a fast paced game, like Overwatch, for example, when there's like a lot of movement on the screen, you might kind of like lose the sight of your crosser, which kind of like affects your aim a lot. So in Valorant, you don't really have this like fast motions. So dot crosser can kind of like be always in your screen. You don't really lose the crosser sight at all. Like maybe sometimes, but usually you don't really use it. So then you can kind of like apply the precision that you kind of like get from the dot crosser inside of the game better. And if you kind of like put some sort of like good techniques on top of it, like taking some sort of time before aiming, like upon reaction or having like a smoother landing of the flick, you might be able to have like more precise shot. And Valorant is like about precision and like the dot provides you like ability to have like high precision. So it makes sense that people are using DOT in Valorant. Like you need to boost a lot more and tap a lot more than in CS. So like in CS, people usually play with like crossers of gap because they can spray as some sort of like um, a backup when they miss the shot. Like you miss the shot, micro adjustment, you spray and you get the kill. In Valorant, sprays are kind of like RNG. So people mainly evolve around precision. So having like a DOT crosser that kind of like provides infinite precision especially when you practice a lot, might be very helpful. So that makes sense why people are using it. Especially Demon 1, when he's like training a lot, he's trying to use his precision better with the dot crosser. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I might have to switch to the dot as well. <laughs> um, <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> okay. I also use dot in CS, by the way, so... <laughs> oh, you do? So that's how it is, yes. Nice, nice. So that's how it is. Okay. Um, right, EBKey on X as well, he, he asked a few different questions, but I'll just pick a couple of them. Um, how to keep shape with minimum training. How to keep shape with minimum training. 
So I feel like the main thing that you would want to kind of have is like fun. You would want to find some fun in entertaining. Like if you want to keep doing it, you will need to make it a bit more fun. Like it's not always about looking for the weakest parts that you have inside of the aim and just playing the hard things all the time. Because when you play hard things all the time, you might lose the motivation, kind of like lose the drive to play. So maybe at first try to experiment with a lot of stuff. Try to find something to enjoy and maybe try to set some sort of like small goal. Because setting small goals that you can achieve is like way more helpful than having like a one big goal that is like overwhelming. You know, like if you have like a very overwhelming goal that you want to achieve like a perfect aim, but you don't really have like any small goals, then you might kind of like lose it in the process. So maybe like set some sort of like a small goal of like finding some fun tasks to play and maybe playing them for at least like five minutes a day, just five minutes. Try to get this habit down, try to like accomplish a small goal and then set like a new goal. Like for example, I will try something a bit harder for like a two days. You've done it, boom, another check and you do like small goals. And if it's like small goals, you might be able to develop some sort of like fun uh, component or like you will just develop this like drive to grind better. That's what I was doing as well, like always having some sort of like small goals. Like even within coaching, we do use some sort of techniques like that, trying to set some sort of goals with the players so we can always like keep ourselves like in the right boat, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, well, the, the next question EBK had was, or the next one I'll choose is, what is, or how, how should consistent aim look? So that's what I was talking before about, like with aiming styles, like I believe that like a consistent aim, like in like FPS games would mainly evolve around cross replacement. And cross replacement is kind of like a passive aim of some sort because you need to have like an, you know, like more stable aim. You need to be able to like trace corners of smoothness and to be able to flick between angles without really like over flicking. So I feel like in tag FPS games, like the perfect aim for me would be like kind of like a mastery of cross replacement and a mix of like very deliberate adjustments. So for example, players like Demon One or Ye that are super good at Valorant are actually pretty much the definition of what I consider as like a perfect aim. So like in my head, that is like perfect aim. In your head, perfect aim might be something different. So it's kind of like, if you think that flicky aim is like more perfect in your head, then it's also fine because as I said before, there's like a place for any type of aimer. You can be smooth aimer, you can be snappy aimer, and you can still be a pro. So there's like a place for any aimer. So you don't really have to like think, okay, this place is perfect and I have to play this place all the time. Not really. Like you can use like any play style. You can consider any play style perfect in your head and you can go towards it with like right training. So I believe to kind of like, just like listen to yourself instead of like listening to someone like me that will tell you, okay, this play style is good because you have the cross replacement, you have this micro adjustments. If in your head flicking is better and has like more perfect potential, you can just follow it and you can also become good because there's like place for everyone. So like for me, good aim is cross replacement with like deliberate shots like Demon 1 and EA. For you, it might be some sort of aim like Asuna, which is also good because both of them or like these players are all at top level. So it kind of like proves that you can be any type of aimer. You can kind of like have any techniques and you can still be at the top. So that's what I believe in. And that's, I, I think that's like a really good guidance too, because I think a lot, I've done this too, you know, I've, I've tried lots of stuff because I'm like, oh, this guy aims really well. I want to see how it feels. And I've, I've definitely kind of forced myself to try things. I'm like, oh, this is like not fun. Uh, it's not actually fun to play like this. And I always like to play with faster sensitivities because it just felt more fun. And that's actually very important, like that element. And we talked about it with, with the mouse shape too. You've got to feel comfortable. You've got to be able to have fun. And so like what style feels like the most fun. And I think it's really important not to lose sight of that, uh, I think to your point. And it's really easy to do it when you, again, we talked about it, like it doesn't feel good to lose. That's not fun. So, yeah. <laughs> so sometimes you're looking to change stuff, but, but yeah. Yeah. Also we need to remember that games are meant to be played with some sort of fun, right? And if we are forcing ourselves to do something that is unfun, we might kind of like lose the main goal of games to have fun. So it's also yeah. like a, something that we need to consider. Right. Well, the last question I'll do from the from the the um, tweet that I made on X was uh, from Kaz. He asked, or well, he said, I can't hit shots at at a long range most of the time, and I'm always like a pixel off. Sometimes I'm a pixel off in mid range shots as well. Is this something I can fix, or do I just have to get good? Yes, you can fix it. So, like previously, I was talking about the sensitivity and muscle memory. And I said that sometimes when you use like a certain sense, for example, like a low sense, we might be mainly using our arm and wrist to aim. And we kind of like have our fingers underdeveloped. And guess what? At like long range duels, we use more of our fingers to do like these micro movements. 
So we can still train them within like aim trainers and become like way better at making them when we kind of like learn how to apply more fingers into them. And like one way that we can do it is by switching our sense to something higher so we kind of like isolate it better. So, for example, if you struggle with like long range duels, like you would want to kind of like introduce more fingers into your aim, like more precision, and build upon it so we can kind of like get some sort of like healthy habits of using it even on your main sense. Because a lot of like low sense players, even though they have like easier time having micro adjustments, they still do struggle with like long range duels just because they are having like fingers on the underdeveloped. It's also like a common case within pro players that I coached. A lot of them are using like lower sensitivity and they struggle a lot with like long range duels and the precision part. and. What usually helps them a lot is kind of like isolating the fingers better and then it's kind of like feeling way more controlled inside of the game. So that's what I would do. Trying to maybe experiment, trying to introduce more fingers into the game, maybe playing some sort of like micro tasks. If you don't really know any micro tasks, you can look up the Valorant benchmarks from Voltaic that we've made recently. There's like a full micro category and there's like a lot of micro tasks that you can try to work on that. Awesome. That's... Pretty good advice. I think it's it's something that's uh, for me with my training now. I'm, I'm really trying to focus on because I need to incorporate much more arm movements because I always started with again faster sensitivity. So to like to do like a 180, I would just do like do a mouse lift as opposed to like using my arm. So I'm still like using my wrist to to kind of reposition, and I wanted to have way more control. And so I'm actually looking to slow my sense down a lot in in my aim training tasks so that I can. I can kind of like really uh, habituate what that new technique. And that's actually something like another quick point I think that I'll make is that when you're trying to add some of these techniques where there's more fingers or whatever, like from my experience, I found that I'm kind of resistant to doing it. Obviously I've been, you know, playing FPS games for like 20 years. So I don't know if that's part of it, but my, my brain's really resistant to it. And it, it wants to, it wants me to go back to what I've always done. So it takes like, and this goes back to the point that you made about like the, the mental aspect too, like understanding what you're trying to do and really trying to force that. Because for me using a slow sensitivity, there's there's a reason why I don't do it. And it's because it doesn't feel fun for me. Um, but like, and, and I think I said this on my last stream when I was when I was streaming this, I'm like, guys, this is not fun for me. <laughs> like I'm not enjoying any of this training, but like yeah. I need to need to do it because when I get into the game, and now I'm like using way more arm. I'm like, I have so much more control and that is fun uh, because I'm, I'm, yes. I'm incorporating that skill with my other skills and just using it in the right places. And now it's like, it makes the game like feel way cool, like better. So it's, it's not always going to be fun, the training, but if you know what kind of outcome you're looking to get, it's, it's again, like the gym analogy again, like, you know, the, the, the reps that you're going to make the most kind of, um, you're going to force the most adaptation in your body with, um, to, to get that muscle growth are the ones that are the hardest that feel like the most shit. And like, you have to really dig deep to kind of get those reps out. And I think it's, there's a similarity here too. You, you, it's not all going to be fun. Some of the training and you have to force yourself to make the changes and you can't just let yourself just revert back to the thing you've always done. And if you put loads of hours into playing and you play casually all the time, that the, the, the issue with that might be that you're not going to be able to, if let's say you're playing eight hours in a day and you're just playing ranked, you're probably not going to be focused in the types of mouse movements that you're trying to habituate. You're probably just going to do what you're already doing. So it's something that's important to bear in mind, I think. True. I do agree with that completely. It's kind of like hard to like force ourselves to like feel challenged at times. Like sometimes it's like really needed to challenge ourselves to get like a higher level. And sometimes there's like this saying, no pain, no gain. And it's kind of like applies to aim training in like a different sense because we don't really want to feel any pain in our hand and wrist because it kind of like leads to health injuries, but pain on like the mental level. So for example, you feel like mentally that you don't really want to be doing, but you know deep down that it will help you. So it's kind of like you need to force yourself to feel challenged so you can reach like higher, higher level. And that's what we do as well in aim trainers. We kind of like always push ourselves out of the comfort zone so we can reach like new heights within aiming. That's that's what we do. We kind of like push that boundaries all the time. Yeah, <laughs> it's really funny because like I, sometimes I'm like doing this aim training, especially when people like come on my stream and I'm doing it on my stream. I'm like, I'm just like moving my mouse and just following this orb left <laughs> and right, and that's like it just seems it's just so mundane and just it feels so boring at times. But again, mm -hmm. there the results are the results are worth it. So. Um, Right. So do you have any uh, plugs for any projects that you're currently working on? Like what, what are you doing um, in the world of 
aiming in the world of coaching? What is Mini up to? Um, so plugs. Maybe I can plug my own coaching service that I started like recently, like two months ago. Because previously I was always like kind of like only working with like pro players mainly with the content creators like you for example right now so i was like mainly focusing on like kind of like sharpening my skills with like pro players now i kind of like do both i can like offer the coaching sessions for the community and pro players as well with the pro players i kind of like coach them and inside of the amped program amped program is kind of like a more often like premium type of service for pro players we kind of like offer weekly sessions we offer our own custom scenario creator low gravity 56 i'm gonna <laughs> mention him as well and so it's kind of like more premium service and there's like much more commitment here because it's kind of like a longer type of program we do out of analysis and stuff like that and i wanted to kind of like bring some sort of that analysis that i do for these pro players to the community as well so i would want to plug the coaching service that I provide on my Twitter as well, on my now X. So like if someone is interested to kind of like work with me or kind of like learn more about me, you can look me up on Twitter at mini.cs and we can like talk about the details when it comes to coaching if someone is interested. Awesome. And uh, if, if people want to get like, you know, you mentioned before getting involved in finding some of these programs um, or benchmarks that Voltaic have, if if uh, if there are some people listening to this and they want to get they're really curious about the aiming community they want to kind of like learn more or find out more what's the best way to to go about that? Best way will be to join Voltaic community. Voltaic is like the biggest aim community out there. We have like the biggest server about aiming. We have like ninety k members. The server is like oriented around our improvement, around aim training, around aim. We have like LH as our team member. We have like all the pro players involved in here as well. So if you are looking for some sort of guides, some sort of benchmarks, like any ideas, like any tips, you want to get some tips from better players, you can like look up Voltaic Discord server, or you can like look up Voltaic on Twitter or like X. <laughs> so like I will go for Voltaic when it comes to like resources. Awesome. All right. Well, I think I think that pretty much covers everything. You got your your coaching plug in there. I hope people take advantage of that. I know I, I you know just like a a testimony right now is a really awesome experience working with Mini. Um, going through the sort of the analysis, seeing what you're good at, seeing what you're you're bad at, and sort of getting the programming that will help you to like all the stuff we talked about of how how do I know what category this like flaw in my aiming like falls in, and then how, where what's then the connection between that and how I have to program and how much time I have to spend and having that individual attention is like very, very valuable. Even if, even if it's something you only invest in for like a short time, like even like a couple of weeks, there, there can be like massive value, uh, I would say. Uh, maybe instead of, you know, buying a couple new mice or whatever, <laughs> put, put, put that <laughs> money into, <laughs> into some coaching, um, definitely valuable. So uh, thank you so much, Mini, for for chatting about aiming with me. I really hope that a lot of people had their minds blown by some of the the knowledge that you were dropping in this, and and that they can kind of like better themselves in their aiming journey. So yeah, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you as well, and see you guys in the aim improvement journey as well. Peace, guys. I'm leaving. Bye bye. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>